Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that is not afraid to admit that dry cleaning might be my arch nemesis or something like that. You'll hear all about it in today's episode, but I have very strong feelings, very dark backstory when it comes to dry cleaning. Okay, that might be a little bit of hyperbole, but anyway, (laughs) I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 153. It's part two of a little mini series about laundry. So if you haven't listened to part one, go give that a listen now and we'll just wait for you. We're just going to sit here and hang out. Oh, oh, you're done already? Okay, great. Well, now we can jump into this episode. So in early January, I asked all of you on Instagram to ask your biggest laundry quandaries. And wow, you you had a lot of questions. Some of them were easy to solve. Some of them were more complicated. But we did a bunch of research to get you the answers. When I say we, I'm not talking about me and Brenda, although Brenda does have a passion for watching me do laundry, sometimes grabbing my hand while I'm trying to fold and biting it. But actually, I have two incredible people here to help me help you. Clothes Horse All-Star and Halloween Queen, Maggie Green and Tracy Pride, a small business owner and mending laundry sewing expert. In fact, when I started to talk to Maggie about doing these laundry episodes, she immediately said, we've got to get Tracy in on it. So here we are, the three of us, and we're here to help you solve your laundry quandaries. Now, once again, this is part two of the series. So please go back and give the last one a listen if you haven't already. In this episode, we're going to tackle your extremely specific stain questions. We'll also share some tips and tricks for dealing with smelly laundry situations. And uh, this one's a classic, removing pet hair. All three of us are big time animal people, so we have a lot of advice and experience there. I'll explain what dry cleaning is, and I'll try to answer the question, if the label says dry clean only, do I really have to dry clean it? Spoiler, maybe not, (laughs) but it's complicated. So you have to listen to find out. Then we'll follow with best practices for hand washing. And lastly, Tracy will give us some ironing lessons. Man, I learned so much working on these two episodes. I hope you have too, just by listening to them. We have a lot to tackle today. After my conversation with Maggie and Tracy, I'll share the biggest laundry lessons I have learned, often the very hard way, and we'll talk a bit about Febreze. I had a lot of questions about Febreze myself. Uh, I thought you might share them, so I looked into it. I'm gonna tell you all about it. So yeah, lots in this episode. We got to get down to it right away. So let's jump back into my conversation with Maggie and Tracy. Okay, so we got a lot of questions about some very specific stains, and I am excited to ask all of you for your expertise here. Some of them really stumped me, so I can't wait to hear what you say. Here's the first one. Is there any way to get white deodorant stains off of dark clothing? That one got me. Me too, because I was like, oh, yeah, I need to know this. This is hard, <laughs> I think. And this this is going to be a recurring theme, like how old is the stain, right? Like yeah. how long have yeah. you had this issue? So in general, the sooner you can get to a stain, the better. So as soon as you recogni- recognize deodorant on your black shirt, like, I mean, if it's instant after you put the deodorant on, that shit will just come off with like your fingernails, a little elbow grease and water. Not a big deal. If it's been there for a while, the only thing that I could think of, and I have tried this before with some success, again, you got to get it early, is salt. Um, you know, again, we talked about it acting as like an exfoliant, kind of a, a scrubbing agent and maybe lemon juice. Um, so like a fine grain salt mm-hmm. and the lemon juice kind of paste and just really work that um work that stain off it kind of brings it to the surface and then it should be fairly easy to to scrub off again if it's like a new stain that that same solution combination of products and elbow grease also works really well for rust stains which tracy mentioned earlier 
Yeah, salt is pretty miraculous. So is, I mean, lemon juice, like there, there was sort of like a natural beauty hack that was making the rounds around social like 10 years ago, which was to put lemon juice on your face as a natural peel. Mm. And I did it once. And I'll just say like, wow, lemon juice is really acidic. <laughs> Maybe don't put it on your face. Don't <laughs> listen to me. I was going to say, it feels a little too acidic to me to want to put that on my face. But uh, I think I made it like 45 seconds. Like, yeah. I just was like, yeah, I can't. I can't. I think you were supposed to do like three minutes. I was like, yeah, hell no. Um, So I have no doubt that lemon juice will get out these kinds of stains. But like Maggie said, it's all about how old they are. If you've already put them through a dryer, things are going to be harder. If you've already washed it in hot water, it's also going to be harder. So one more just, you know strike in the in the column for air, line dry and cold mm-hmm. water right okay this one was another one that was like really oddly specific um because the question is what about sunscreen stains which is the one we've all coped with on yes. white clothes and i was like what people wear white clothes <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i know luxurious it's, it's such a bad idea <laughs> yeah, I know, it's such a bad right? idea to wear white clothes <laughs> so what do you got here catching it right away like for me with sunscreen, if we've been, if we've been doing an activity where we were sunscreened up, I just want to soak everything in OxyClean before I even launder it the rest mm-hmm. of the way, mm-hmm. just to help cut out any greasy, oily, crappy stains before anything gets a chance to get sit in there. But Maggie, go for it. Yeah. I think the question is like, what, what is the sunscreen made out of? And at its basic level, like, is it oil-based or is it water-based? Mm-hmm. Is there both are prevalent? So anything oil based as we mentioned before dawn dish soap right it like it's a mm-hmm. degreaser it breaks up yeah. oil particles so you could definitely try that this is kind of pre-treating with dawn dish soap before you wash it again you're going to hear us say this like if you've already baked it in if you've washed it in hot water and dried that stuff like you might not have the opportunity to get the stain out but provided you've just noticed it you could try dawn for an oil based sunscreen for water-based, I'd actually try like vinegar and baking soda. Baking soda, probably salt would also work. It's like got that kind of grit that, mm-hmm. you know, is going to break up whatever whatever the stain is and kind of bring it to the surface. Um, you can make a paste out of vinegar and baking soda. You could even try the lemon juice, salt. Um, they kind of act similarly with the, the acid and the exfoliator. Uh, mm-hmm. I would say let it sit overnight and definitely try a little bit of scrubbing. Use that elbow grease and then you can probably just toss it in the wash from there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you will get it to a point where probably no one's going to see it on it. I feel pretty confident about that with sunscreen. Um, okay. This is one I actually dealt with this problem recently on vacation. So I have my own solution. But what Sweet. about discolored sweat paint stains, especially in the armpits and collar grime? AKA ring around the collar. Do you remember those commercials? What brand was it? It was like whisk oh. or something like that. Oh, I remember those too. Is whisk a detergent or did I make that up? I, it, it rings a bell. It just seems like such a strange name. I guess you're like whisking it into the washing machine or something. <laughs> anyway, right? I remember am the commercial I, for I ring around the now? collar and it was like basically like pour all this extra detergent on the collar and then wash it with more detergent. And then you, it's like the uh, directions on shampoo that are like, you know, add shampoo to hair, lather, rinse, repeat. I'm like, no, 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 no. Nobody needs to be washing their hair twice. Right. You know? What do you mean repeat? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That used to perplex me as a kid. Um, I believe I learned from an episode of Oprah that you're not supposed to do that. And it was like, whew, what a relief because I haven't been. So Maggie, what do you have here for sweat stains and collar grime? Okay. Honestly, the, this stumped me, but I started thinking about this like, you know, using my deduction skills. I'm like, if what my magician laundry mom says is true and peroxide is a solution for body fluids, can that also be true for like sweat stains? Ooh, yeah. Uh, it's also yeah. important to remember yeah. that they're like sweat has a super high salt content. So when mm-hmm. you're looking at that stain, like it's kind of white and crusty, right? Like almost like a deodorant stain. Um, yeah. If you're using an aluminum-based deodorant, you're going to see some real funky colors, like in the yellow and green family, in the armpits and on your collars, things like that. Um, yeah, I like my go-to is like vinegar, baking soda paste, 
or you could try peroxide. For peroxide mm -hmm. specifically, I would say limit that to light colored items only because it can have like a bleaching oh, yeah. effect. Definitely, definitely do a spot check for that for sure. Uh, I learned on our my most recent trip to Japan that I am like a person with apparently like a disgustingly filthy neck. I had no idea. Uh, <laughs> really, really life changing for me. But I had, you know, where I live in Austin, like I rarely have to wear a winter coat. I mean, even like a top layer, rarely a little, little bit right now, but I think today was like 60, you know, but we went to Japan and it was more like 30s at night, high 40s, low 50s in the daytime. We actually really lucked out from a weather perspective, but I still needed to wear a coat. And I have this light blue cloud print coat that I love to death. It's from Selkie and I wore it every day with pride. But with two days left in our trip, I don't know what happened. It was like hanging over a chair in our hotel room. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, the entire back of the collar is like brown. I am a mm -hmm. disgusting person. I think it was just a mixture of like oil from my neck, probably stuff I put in my hair, pollution probably sticking to that, like all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was it was it was gross. And I was like, did I ruin this coat by like not washing my neck enough or something and being <laughs> like addicted to lotions or something like what happened here? And we came home and I soaked the whole thing in OxyClean. It's like it never happened. It was in wow. incredible. Yeah, really, really awesome. And there was another time on our trip. This was a different trip we went on where I took the jacket and I can't remember. I think I got um, Taco Bell sauce all over the sleeve and I was oh. like, oh man, no, oh. it's ruined. And we we were on a road Ooh. trip. It was here, not in Japan. And we went to Walgreens and I bought some OxyClean and I just soaked the sleeve. <laughs> Came right out. <laughs> anyway, sorry, this is not, this podcast is not sp sponsored by OxyClean, but I will say I'd never used it on like that kind of like grime that is definitely a mixture of like oil from your hair, oil from your body, whatever's mm -hmm. in your yeah. hair, pollution sticking to it, all that stuff. The elements. Uh, <laughs> the elements. Yeah. It's all the things. I was like, I can't, I literally said, I can't believe I have ring around the collar. Um, <laughs> I thought it was better than that. Um, anyway, I don't really think I washed my neck because this, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I'm going to try to do better this year. Um, anyway, so I, the OxyClean was sort of like, I'm going to try this before I try anything else because it seems like this will be the least damaging to this coat. And it mm -hmm. was like brighter and better than ever. So that's, I think that's a great one if you're dealing with really dingy stuff and especially on like something light colored like that. I was a little concerned because, you know, like with synthetics, sometimes that stain is just there. Yeah. And I was imagining that probably like anything weird and oily was just like stuck on there forever. So that, that was. I, what a pleasant surprise i was like otherwise i'm gonna have to wear this coat for like 10 more years and everyone's gonna know i have a gross neck for the rest of time you know <laughs> uh, i promise everyone i'm gonna wash my neck more this year just wear your hair okay. down forever no one will ever know exactly but then you feel like what if you were in a place where you had to check the coat Ooh, take like a museum yeah, that's true. and then they're like oh, i think you should leave right <laughs> um anyway i don't know if they can do that um so that's my story about how gross my neck is uh, someone asked, <laughs> they would love to hear, and they used many O's in this, they would love to hear about how to get out old stains if it's even impossible. And, you know, specifically be because of old stains that are thrifted. So what are your thoughts there, Maggie? I mean, I, at this point, I kind of feel like a, a broken record, right? Like, it depends, right? If, if you It depends, it, yeah. yeah. It how really long, does depend. How long has that stain been there? Is it fresh? With thrifted items, I would probably bank on the fact that it is baked in, in which case, like, I'm sorry to report, I don't have a good answer for you. Like, sometimes you're just out of luck, especially depending on what the, like, the fabric content, some of those synthetics just really are not forgiving at all. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. My suggestion would be kind of... in instead of trying to remove the stain how do you work around it how do you make the garment useful beyond like this tiny defect whatever it is and in which case i would recommend 
like call somebody like Tracy, get some visible mending, something cool. You could do over dyeing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, as far as like reviving colors and garments, if it's like a dark stain on a light fabric, if you over dye it with a darker color, sometimes it will just blend right out and camouflage it completely. Um, but yeah, as far as removing the actual stain, this is, this is one of the stories with a sad ending. Like, you're kind of out of luck, I think. <laughs> I mean, I will say OxyClean has, has really come in there for me, especially like Dustin really loves secondhand teas, like vintage teas, and we've found some really gross ones. And in many, not all, of course, situations, a soak in OxyClean has gotten them so close that like you'd have to be looking for the stain. I don't think it's ever 100% removed it but sometimes it's like surprising like what you think is a stain is actually just schmutz um lydia of country feedback vintage of vital called into the podcast like a year or two ago to talk about the most epically stained pair of sweatpants she'd ever sourced i mean we're talking like major blood lots of blood kind of situation Whoa. that had probably been on these pants for decades and she soaked it in retro clean she swears that if nothing else will work, retro clean will. Oh, okay. That's something you can order it online, and I believe it's like a family-owned business. Um, it's not dissimilar from OxyClean, but I'm sure some of the blend of it is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would definitely try that as well because she was astounded. It was like it had never happened. Um, I'm telling you, OxyClean paste. When you make it a paste, it has taken out some killer stains that I never imagined that I would get rid of, and I have no doubt that it could, at least in some cases, work on thrifted stuff when you just have no idea how old the stain mm -hmm. is. Yeah, totally. Or like what it is. You know, I've mm -hmm. I one year found this wedding dress at a thrift store, and I decided this is going to be my part of my Halloween costume, like no matter what. It was at the bins. So it was like a dollar. Maybe it was two because it was a little heavy. And it was like a beige uh, lace, you know, overlay. And I was like, you know, there was there were some weird stains on it, like in the armpits and around the neck. And I was like, I'm just going to give it a soak just so it's like at its peak, peak level of cleanliness. And I put it in the tub with some OxyClean. And wouldn't you know it, it was a white dress. <laughs> it was a when I took it out, Yeah, it was incredible. Damn. And like whatever the OxyClean had done to clean it, like left a massive ring of like brown in my tub. Like, Ooh, it yeah. had gotten out. Ooh. This was definitely a dress from like the late 60s, maybe very early 70s that had been at the bins. I mean, it was like incredible. So I do, once again, OxyClean is usually like if you if nothing else is working, this is a really good try. I don't know how it work if you had already dried it in a dryer or tried to set it like had accidentally set it with hot water. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's always going to work, but sometimes if you sometimes you just kind of know when you find something that like it's time to just move all the way up to level five with stain removal, <laughs> skip all the stuff in between, and that's when OxyClean comes in like immediately and is the hero for sure. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. 
Gabriella Antonis is a visual artist and an ethical trade fashion designer. But Gabriella is also a radical feminist micro business. She's the one woman band trying to help you understand why slow fashion is what the earth needs. The one woman band to help you build your own brand. She can take your fashion line from just a concept and do your sketches, pattern making, grading, sourcing, cutting, and sewing. The second option is for those who aren't trying to start a business and who just want ethical garments. Gabriella Antonis will create custom made to measure garments just for you. Her goal is to help help one person of any size at a time, including beyond size 40. To inquire about this serendipitous intersectional offering of either concept, DM her on Instagram to book a consultation. Please follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Gabriella Antonis. And that's Gabriella with one L. Gotta get that spelling right. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at dylanpagelifeandstyle. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand-blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Fagavon Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single-stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. Now we're going to talk about smelly situations. These are some more questions mm-hmm. from the clothes horse community. Um, this is one that I have dealt with quite a bit in my life. Um, sometimes before I've even worn the garment, which is how do you get the armpit stink out of polyester clothing? Mm, this is nearly impossible. Synthetics are such a mess yeah i'm, I'm such a mess with I'm that stumped like okay tell me. i have yeah. <laughs> one one that i have heard from people it is not a surefire method um you probably have to be 21 to participate in this in this technique Ooh. um 
a mixture, a very strong mixture of vodka and water sprayed into it, or even just straight up vodka. Ooh. People assure me, I have not tried this, that you won't smell the vodka after it evaporates, but I would just give it a really hard sniff <laughs> before yeah. wearing it. Yeah. But it does make sense to me that, I mean, ultimately, you know, the armpit stink comes from bacteria. And so what you're going to be doing is like killing that bacteria with vodka. I think that this is a technique that I could not use. I think it would trigger me into getting a, mig- getting a migraine or <sighs> throwing up because even just saying the word vodka is kind of giving me... I know, I'm thinking about flavored vodka, though, which is just so gross. <laughs> that makes me <laughs> think of grain alcohol and Everclear, which, like, speaking yeah. of throwing Oof. up Moonshine. and triggers, Moonshine! Like, you know, in college, right, we would, like, use it as a mixer because we were broke, and it was, like, all about, like, m- the most bang for our buck. But in actuality, grain alcohol is great for, like, cleaning and... Um, I can't think of the word right now. I guess disinfecting. So I wonder if oh, disinfecting if for the sure. Same I bet would be true. grain alcohol would work too. Yeah, it mm-hmm. would. It would seem to. You know, I recently got a pair of boots that were just like. Oh, I was like, I need to wear these boots for at least ten years. So I bought myself a pair of Red Wing shoes, and they were so freaking stiff. And I was like, I can't wear these. They're making like my toes numb because they're just so stiff. Yeah. And I went down this rabbit hole of how you can stretch shoes, um, which happens to me a lot, whether they're secondhand or brand new, like ultimately, you know how it is. Your shoes end up being comfortable because they've adapted to your specific foot and the way you are. So this is something, it doesn't matter whether you have brand new shoes or secondhand. Uh, Often there's a break-in period. And basically I found this advice that, by the way, it worked. Um, It did take about a week. But you mix alcohol. You can also do vodka or I guess I guarantee grain alcohol. You mix it about 50% alcohol, 50% water and spray it inside the shoe, like saturate it. And then you jam the shoe with crumpled up paper. Or in my case, I just stuffed tons and tons of dish towels in there until it was just like bursting. Like I was using like brute force to jam more in there (laughs) and laced it up and tied it sat it on the counter, let it dry overnight. The next day I took it out and tried it on. I was like, okay, it's like they're getting closer, but they're not there. And I repeated this, the spray, jamming all the dish towels in there for a week. Wow. And wouldn't you know, after a week, they fit me like okay. perfectly. Nice. That doesn't work on suede. Just don't do it. It will ruin the color, but oh, it does yeah, work on leather. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I do think that there is like, there are all these other uses for things that we've never thought of. Like someone had to, right? someone said, I'm going to put a bunch of alcohol in my shoes and just see what happens. And it works. <laughs> Fuck around and find out, right? Well, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Pi- I love these people who are the pioneers of <laughs> right? finding out for us. Yeah. <laughs> and that way to, way to also kill the bacteria in the shoe that might be making it smelly, especially if it's a secondhand yeah, shoe. Yeah. Seriously. Science. Dang. It's incredible. Double duty. I don't know if it works Double for duty. other kinds of alcohol, like, uh, whiskey or rum or gin, but you're welcome to find out and report back. <laughs> yeah, let us know. <laughs> let us right? know. We just want to know. FY- <laughs> a little FYI, I have I have a I have a distiller, so I mean I can make us moonshine for our laundry quarters. Oh, there you go. I love this. I think <laughs> I think you just started a new business. It's a new trend. It's my next business. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so the next question was one I was actually really excited that someone submitted this question because I was like, yeah, I've always wondered this too. How do I get rid of that awful Febreze smell, which you know it, if you know it, you know it, on wool mm-hmm. and silk thrifted clothing and fabrics? Do people still oh. use Febreze? They do, right? It feels so yeah. 90s to me, but it is like a very specific smell that I know way too well. Yeah. Um, and it really takes me back to when people smoked in bars. Because I had this one jacket. I mean, I only had one jacket, right? So I'd wear it out to a bar and it would smell like an ashtray the next day. And when you know it, yeah. I would just freeze it and hang it up in my bathroom. And it didn't smell like smoke anymore in a day. But it did smell like Febreze. It reeked up Febreze, yeah. Reeked up Febreze, yeah. The more outside air you can give it, the better. Yeah. Agreed, yeah, yeah. Like that. that is one way to help disperse the smell. Yeah, my go-to yeah. is always vinegar with like stink with stenches. It's like, you know, vinegar seems to neutralize 
break up the odor. I think if it's like a really delicate fabric, all you can do is time and fresh air. Mm -hmm. Because it's just like that Febreze gloms on there. I don't know what they put Mm -hmm. in it. And does someone think that smells good? Like, I have so many questions. I, Does it have to smell that way to work? They probably figure it smells better than, you know, the icky, musty smell yeah. that it might have come in with. That I guess that's I guess that's the case. Airing it out, exposing it to the sun. That's it. The sun will probably help. Just time. That's kind of is with the, like a lot of stinky stuff. I mean, some stuff there's a very clear like chemical path to curing it, but like with gain, for example, when I've bought something secondhand and it's been gainified, the best thing I can do is just like <laughs> hang it on the back porch and give it some time. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just wait. It's like, once again, you got to kind of slow it down. Out. Yeah. Okay. So this is a very, very specific question. <laughs> I'm just going to preface this. I use tea towels to strain stock, but I don't use bleach. So then they start to stink. What can I do? Maggie, I know you've got ideas here. Again, my first thought <laughs> is vinegar, but like overnight soaking, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe yeah. even two or three soaks in a row. Definitely exposure to fresh air and sunlight will help lift mm-hmm. that. Yeah. That's funny. When I first read this, I was picturing like an old tea smell, but they're tea towels and the stock could be vegetable or meat based. So. Who knows what that smells like over time. Um, it's definitely a very uh, specific question for sure. But yeah, I'd go vinegar. Yeah. You could probably try OxyClean in lieu mm-hmm. of bleach. Peroxide. Definitely peroxide. peroxide. I would also say lemon. This is a great candidate for like you put them in a Ooh, pot yeah. and boil them with lemon. Because um, that would also, yeah. if it's an oily kind of stock, like if it's a meat stock, it would probably help break down that oil that's probably holding the scent. You know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would suppose uh, a soak in some alcohol and water, like booze, I'm talking, uh, would probably do it too. It's all about, in most situations here, it's either about killing the bacteria or breaking up the fat, right? That is holding onto the fragrance. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think just depending on like what you've used, what kind of stock we're talking about, there's a path forward there. That sounds like a Dawn job too. I agree. Yeah. If it's meaty, definitely. I would like, I think I would just like soak it in, in, in water and Dawn and just like let it, let the towel sit there. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. So I also just want to say like, I don't use Dawn to wash my dishes. It's like a way to, I mean, it just destroys my hands, but I do keep a bottle in the laundry room specifically yep. for these kinds of situations. Same. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. We've got some more laundry crises here. Um, this was a really interesting question because I have definitely experienced this. Too. Someone asked, I want to know if it's possible to get rid of the color that got stuck, like the same textile from the pink parts to the white parts. This has totally happened to me many times without fading away the actual pattern colors. There are actual color removing products. Um, RIT makes one, Carbona, Carbona, I'm not sure how to say that, Mm, makes one. And a lot of times that will, like, I think you put it through in the washer and it helps to draw that, that the dye out that has faded from something else. That's one way to try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and once again, the ideal situation here where you're going to have the most success is if you have not dried it in the dryer. Yes. Yes. Line dry it. Yeah. Please, if you take anything away from this, <laughs> hang <laughs> things to dry. If you take one one little gem away from this, it's hang your things yes, to dry. Yes, it just buys you time. It guarantees it's not as yeah. much of a disaster. Um, did you have other yeah. advice about this if, if someone is a little nervous about using RIT or Carbona? That one, other than those, I am not sure. I have, I am a huge fan of, I, I'm not a huge fan of bleach, but I am a huge fan of Clorox bleach pens. Yes, For very, agreed. you know, specific. Yes. I'm obsessed with Clorox bleach pens. Now, depending on, you know, it's going to depend on how the color ran. Like, did it run and you've got a few spots where it showed up on there? And also, what color is the garment that got faded on? Can you actually use bleach? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but I'm a big fan of Clorox bleach pens for that kind of thing as well. Yeah, I when agree. Appropriate. I agree. Maggie, do you have any suggestions here? I don't specifically. I just have empathy for the person who submitted the question. Like it's <laughs> happened a lot. I have a 
I'm thinking about like a red and white color block scuba neoprene dress. It's always a color block thing. Oh, yeah. 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 I have not done this, but I have heard very great things about using Carbona for this. Okay. So I, I, I would highly recommend that. But once again, with the caveat that if you dried it in the dryer, you're going to have less success. So if, if this is hopefully something you discovered when you pulled it out of the washing machine before you dried it, Um, another reason to just like slow down and take a look, you know? Yep. Okay. So this is something that happens to me about every three months. Um, I accidentally washed a jacket with a tissue in the pocket. Now Mm -hmm. the jacket is covered in tissue paper residue. What is the best way to remove the bits of tissue paper? Lint brush, rewash. That's yep. something that's worked fairly well for me. I lint I brush agree. and I rewash. Because yeah. if you get it wet, that can help pull those back off of there once they've dried on them. But yeah, that's my main thing. Because of course, everybody does that here and there. But that's my best bet for the for getting it off. You must go clean out the washing machine before you do another oh, yes. load. Because then the problem oh, yes. keeps going. I have learned this one. I actually... I remember the first time it really happened to me as an adult was at the laundromat. So also, if you're using the laundromat, please, please check before and after. Okay. This is something that I, I'm going to preface by saying I have had moderate success with trying to reverse, but it's not always a guarantee. Are there any ways to unshrink or stretch something that's been shrunk? I have feelings about this. I have, I have thoughts about it. Okay. Tell us your thoughts. Kids. Yeah. Tell us. Um, the, it's if it's something delicate, you're probably out of luck. But um, when something shrinks, if you rewash it and get it damp again, and you can do some gentle stretching, you can do some stretch. Depending on the on how much, honestly, depending on the fabric, like an if a, a stretch fabric, sure. This actually because you people have probably noticed that even when you're washing wovens and they're wet, when they're wet, they tend to actually have a little bit of give. Mm-hmm. So this can work for wovens too. But getting it nice and damp again and very gently using some stretching and then let it dry flat um, after you have done the appropriate stretching. That is something I have used repeatedly for when I shrink something and it's too short for me. I can make it, I can stretch it out a little bit when it's damp and then I let it dry, you know, air dry flat. Totally. It reminds me of the blocking process for like knitters and crochet crochet and things like that. So my question is this concept of like hand stretching kind of while it's, you know, laying it out flat, do we need to secure that in place with something or Mm -hmm. like, is it going to hold its, hold the stretched shape on its own? If it doesn't hold the stretch shape, then yeah, you would want to hold it with something. But when I've done it, I usually just stretch it and let it go. But that's a good idea. Actually, if I had something on the sides that would probably, you know, as it dries, it would uh, be less likely to shrink up. So yeah, actually that's a genius idea. Yeah, totally. I was thinking, paperweights or yeah. shit, your bottle of laundry detergent that weighs, yeah. you know, whatever, like yeah. um, something to hold it in place, maybe. Definitely. Yeah. I also just add, if you have a strong threshold for discomfort, um, you can put the wet garment on your body and wear it Ooh. around the house. Um, and I can say that because <laughs> I've done that and it's been successful. It is not for everyone. <laughs> yeah, no. I think I think my sensory would be like, nah. Oh yeah, you <laughs> nah. have to be like, I have like a very strong threshold for pain. So like, I have shrunk jeans and put them, made them soaking wet, and wore them around my house for six hours, and I have been miserable, and my skin was raw. You know what? Oh, they went back to it, their normal your jeans size. Fucking fit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, like, worth it. <laughs> one time I did this, yep. and this is probably like getting you know borderline close to like yeast infection territory. I wore tights mm-hmm. underneath so that my skin wouldn't be like on fire, and that was significantly <sighs> more comfortable. But like, I'm sure someone somewhere is going to tell you you shouldn't wear a pair of like synthetic tights with some wet pants wet over them. Clothes. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Um, I have done similar things with tops as well. They're a little bit easier, but when it's like a pant, who you are in for it, but it works. <laughs> you know, there was like a thing like shrink to fit like jeans. Like the th- plan was that you would like put them on and sit in a bathtub in them, you know, like, like yeah. this is like people did this stuff and I, I have done this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. This is a good one. This is another thing that happens to me a lot. How do I remove pet hair from my clothes? This is my favorite question so far because I think 
most everyone who's listening and certainly all of us who are participating in this conversation have this experience regularly. Yes. So, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and some, and by the way, not all pet hair is created equal. That is true. It's true. My yeah. shaggy white wiry coated dog. It's a nightmare. Go on. Oh, that's like what sticks to you for yep. ever. It never goes away. Yes. You might have to go yeah. tweezers in that, you know, for that. Yeah. <laughs> like, pick yeah, them out individually yes, definitely so my you're not even joking like for real my number one recommendation what i'm about to tell you it's different than the garment shaver that was referenced previously when we were talking about sweaters and pilling but this tool mm -hmm. is used in the same context to remove pilling from sweaters it's called a sweater comb but it actually works on any fabric and there are a couple of different variations um usually the most common one you'll see it's like it's this little semicircle shaped hand tool with like a, a plastic handle and the the workable surface is like wrapped in this brass mesh looking material and that really like it's almost it's not sticky to the touch but it is sticky when you when it comes into contact with mm -hmm. fabric there's another variation that's made for like like things like angora and more um more more hair like fibers um but it will actually work to remove pet hair from the surface of any garment um the other one this is probably going to be a surprise to y'all and i actually just discovered this a couple years ago um i originally like discovered it by trying to clean furniture cloth furniture a pet hair brush like the oh. little little kind of cheapy ones that have the um like thin metal bristles any i know what you're talking about and uh, lots of them lots of the thin metal mm -hmm. bristles. exactly like yes. really dense um yeah and of course you're going to want to be mindful of like the nap of the fabric which direction the the fibers go but either way like you can go against the nap and you can see that shit like starting to roll up and kind of pile up Sweet. just pull it right off um so yeah it works on furniture works on clothing just be really careful because they are metal bristles you would not mm -hmm. want to do that to like your favorite sweater necessarily i mean you could just be really gentle um the other thing and this is kind of a recent discovery to lint rollers right not all lint rollers are created equal the most common mm -hmm. ones we see are like those sticky tape rip off like super wasteful ones I recently discovered a reusable one that like you just rinse off with water. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a sticky surface. Mm -hmm. You rinse it off in the sink or wherever. And yeah, that works really well, particularly for like fine hairs, like the bigger, thick, wiry ones. I would go for the, the actual pet hairbrush. But yeah, all three of those work. Um, sweater comb, that, pet hairbrush. I can't wait to go try that. I know. I'm like, can I? <laughs> Just like you were talking about, um, seriously, you know, possible gifts or whatever, the hints from Heloise. I, yeah. I want to give people sweater combs. Like, don't use a shaver. Please you gave me one. Yes, you gave I me did. one. Like, yep. everyone I'm I know. so freaking excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I, the thing about the shaver is, like, you're literally cutting off the garment. And you know the top that's going to be, yeah, that's going to end poorly. It, it, like it, the more you do that, the, the sooner that's going to end poorly. Exactly. It's going to get thin. Exactly. Exactly. It's really, I, I would assume it just produces more pilling over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to also add, there's this special brush that Dustin brought to the marriage. Um, <laughs> It's called a Lily brush. I think that's the brand and it's like red and it has a handle and it's got really short really really short bristles and you look at it and you're like what could this thing do for me um it is amazing for getting pet hair off of rugs upholstery hats coats Ooh. anything kind of wooly um with no damage and it's just like so good at it when I mean, you just like pull the hair off and throw it in the trash and it's very gentle um i i don't understand how they do it there's something magical about it it's like 20 bucks you can get it on Chewy. I'm sure you can get it at a lot of pet shops. And it does a better job of cleaning our rugs than my vacuum does. I'm looking at this little nice. guy. And I guess they have, like, they have different variations and sizes. There's, like, a pocket 
pocket version. There's like a larger brush with a longer handle version. This is really cool. We have the one with the handle and it's kind of like angled. Uh -huh. It looks like a trowel or something for gardening. And it is incredible. I mean, we've had this for years and years at this point, and it is wildly still effective because you just clean it off and it keeps going. Nice. I don't know how it works. It's it's one of those things that's like so simple. You're like, how did they do that? It's also kind of good if you're trying to pick up crumbs or something mm. too. I don't, I don't know. It's a great. It's got many applications around your house. For $20, it's a sound investment. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they don't, yeah. it doesn't look like it wears out. Like, it's not something that you would have to replace. It doesn't. Just kind of rinse it or yeah. pull the yeah, stuff out. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a human hairbrush or even a regular pet hairbrush. Like, it just keeps going. Yeah. I mean, you just, like, pull the hair off and it's ready for the next round. So That's awesome. I would also recommend that one. Okay. Yeah. This is a question that I... There was a time in my life, it's not as much now, where I pretty much exclusively wore black clothing because, to be honest, you know, I'm riding my bike, I'm working, I got a kid. It's like the safest way to not get stained. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> we all know that, you know, it fades, right? So is there a way to revive black clothing and how can you best care for dark clothing? No hot. No hot anything. Ever. 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 No hot yeah. anything. If you're talking about it's already like Maggie and I were talking about this. And if you're talking about that's something that's already faded, like if you thrifted it or if it's a beloved piece of garment, over dye, just over dye. Yeah. You can totally refresh it with over dyeing. Totally, totally. And, you know, like do your research, read about it. There are ways to effectively dye clothing and less effectively. And there are definitely variations in terms of branding. But I definitely remember having a roommate who also wore a lot of black clothing and we would just periodically do a huge afternoon of dyeing all our clothes black again. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was very effective. Um, I also just say like, I definitely have friends in my life who they really are pained by the idea of wearing two different shades of black. Like one thing's faded or one's oh, more that would brown be and one's more blue. And you know what? Like, go with it. It's pretty, actually. I really like when I see variations <laughs> in an outfit like that. It adds texture and interest. Um, And I would just say, wash it in cold water. Uh, wash it inside out, especially with jeans, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Um, Don't, you know what? I, I can't believe this hasn't come up yet. It's going to come up again. Don't wash stuff all the time. Thank Which you. I know is hard. It is hard, right? And I think we are in this culture. We're raised in this culture that, like, you got to wash the clothes every time or you'll be dirty <laughs> or you will smell or people will think less of you. But and there are definitely things like, listen, I'm not suggesting that you should just keep rewearing the same pair of underwear. I was washing, just thinking, right? underwear oh, is the exception. No. Right? No, yeah, we're not saying that. I say no. same thing. You get super sweaty in your gym clothes. I have no expectations mm -mm. that you're going to wear them again tomorrow. Yeah. But like, T-shirts, you know, eh, maybe they don't need wash. Maybe they do. Sweaters, jeans. Especially. Who washes yeah. jeans exactly. every time they wear them? Right. If you wash your jeans every time you wear them, I don't know. If you have crappy, low-quality jeggings, you probably have to because they no longer stay yes. on your body after that. But, like, <laughs> that's a red flag that you shouldn't buy those exactly. again. Exactly. Right? Yes. But I do think, like, if if it's, like, a dress, for example, you probably don't need to wash it every time. And if the armpits are a little sweaty, like, Stinky, you know, spray them with some vodka. <laughs> Not for breeze. They'll be fine. <laughs> just no for breeze. Yeah, you know? yeah, no for breeze. Just just vodka. Or I actually like, you know, I I have a lot of like synthetic clothes, and I'm just like taking care of them for the rest of time. And if I'm, I find frequently like if I'm on a work trip, like I go to a lot of like trade shows and stuff where I'm like walking all around all day, and I'm in like weird convention centers that like have strange airflow temperature stuff i get kind of sweaty and stinky um and i will literally just in the sink in the hotel just wash the armpit you know and then it's fine when it up to dry yeah so yeah. you can do that too like rather than washing the whole thing if you're enjoying this episode then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at close horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you just like npr and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass, or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy 
that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment. I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at republica underscore unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnicware, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnicware in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnicware recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. The Pewter Thimble is a curated secondhand shop based out of Rome, Italy. Owner Desiree Marie Townley has a background in costuming and makeup for dance and opera and focuses on dressing for the character you want to be in the world. Curated collections are dropped in a story sale and always have a specialized theme like the color palette of Starry Night, the film classic Casablanca, and the children's novel The Secret Garden. Desiree works with local artisans, and pieces are rescued from markets and rehabilitated and resold with worldwide shipping. The Pewter Thimble is a collection of pieces that will have eternal style from the Eternal City. Discover more on Instagram at The Pewter Thimble. Speaking of washing and not washing so much, I got so many questions about dry cleaning and so i thought like let's just break it down so i'm going to start by saying i'm not a fan of dry cleaning just on a personal level i had an amazing vintage dress for my prom and my mom said i'm going to get that dry clean for you and that sounded very sophisticated very fancy and adult 
I was very <laughs> excited. I get it. The night, you know, get comes back in the plastic bag. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like so middle class now. And I put it on to go to the prom and I broke out in hives all oh. over my body from the dry cleaning chemicals. So that was the end of dry cleaning in my Shit. life. But it was one of those things where, I mean, we see a lot of clothes that say dry clean only. Mm -hmm. And it became my mission very early on to figure out if that meant I really had to dry clean it only. So we're going to talk about dry cleaning. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on dry cleaning as well. Um, first off, what is dry cleaning? Dry cleaning is the process of cleaning clothing without the use of water, hence the dryness. Instead, they your clothes are sprayed with a chemical solvent that basically has the bare minimum of water. So your clothes don't get wet. And a dry cleaning solvent cleans the surface of the material. So get off like dirt and some stains. It will get rid of odors as well because those are often living on the surface of the fabric. But the solvents don't soak into the fibers, which is where you can sometimes have garment damage, especially on really delicate things. If you throw a silk dress, say, in the washing machine, it's going to be submerged in water for a really long time, which makes it more delicate. And then it's getting all whipped around. And so the dry clean is kind of the opposite, right? Like it's hanging, it's just being sprayed. It's very gentle, um, except for like how it's really crazy chemicals, which we're going to talk about. Um, and really dry cleaning is intended for clothing that cannot withstand the twisting and heat of a wet wash and dryer. We're going to put a pin in that point because we're going to come back to that. Um, it turns out dry cleaning has been around since the days of the Romans. Um, back then, they were using ammonia to do dry cleaning, which sounds horrifying to me. Um, and they were specifically using this process on their togas, which were made of wool. And what they had discovered is that when they were being washed, of course, in super hot water, with the rest of the laundry, they were shrinking. And so someone was like, you know, what we should just do is spray these guys with ammonia. <laughs> so gross. That is terrifying. That's terrifying. terrifying. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Super gross. So at some point, someone said, you know, this is terrifying and disgusting. Uh, let's try something new. And someone said, hey, I have a really great idea. Why don't we try using gasoline or kerosene? Oh, that's so, so much maybe that's better. more horrifying, what? right? Yeah. This period of cleaning clothing with gas and kerosene went on way longer than you would think. And unsurprisingly, this was a highly flammable and dangerous situation. So dry cleaning facilities had to be placed on like the outskirts of towns and cities because they caught on fire and exploded. Very Ooh. often. Also, I wonder. I wonder why that wasn't the end of it. <laughs> I know, but people are like, "Oh, this is the best we've got." Um, yeah, your and your clothes would smell like gasoline when you got them back. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am just going to say that I am not convinced that that still doesn't happen because way back when I was working retail, we would sometimes get in less clothing, but more like home goods, like rugs. And throw pillows and stuff that when we would unpack them smelled like gasoline and we have to like air them out. And I just can't imagine why else they would have smelled that way. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1930s, people said, hey, you know, these laundries are exploding all the time. We probably should try something new. And that was when they began using something that I'm hopefully going to pronounce correctly. Uh, perchloroethylene. Fortunately, it's commonly known as perk, so we're going to call it perk for the rest of this. Um, perk is, to put it extremely mildly, uh, bad news bears. <laughs> Maybe not as bad as gas. I don't know. Uh, in the 1970s, so f about 40 years into using perk, uh, studies began to suggest that perk was a carcinogen. Not surprising, right? Uh, mice that would eat that substance or inhale its vapors were more likely to develop liver tumors. Ooh. And the American Cancer Society has done other research uh, that indicates, and this is in humans, that indicates that workers who would work in these dry cleaning facilities were, and therefore were regularly exposed to perk would have increased rates of lymphomas um, and esophagus, kidney, cervix, and bladder cancers. Um, and now, today, perk is considered a neurotoxin. Exposure to it can cause dizziness, blurred vision loss of coordination and simply picking up a perk clean garment that isn't properly dried 
can temporarily trigger those symptoms. Even longer exposure, regular exposure to the fumes from perk can lead to memory loss. Um, it's just like, why do we use this, right? Yeah. A single spilled drop of perk can push through the concrete foundations of a dry cleaning facility past layers of rock and soil all the way down to groundwater reservoirs. Damn. I mean, it is bad. If you've ever lived in a city where there was a prime piece of real estate that appeared to be an empty former dry cleaner mm. and no one's buying it, this Damn. is why. We had this in Portland for a really, really long time. Wow. A place that was like in one of the most expensive neighborhoods just sitting empty for years and years because of this kind of contamination. Or that even buying that that property and trying to uncover what may or may not be there could be really expensive. Wow. So people know today that perk is bad news, but it's still used in 70% of dry cleaning businesses. <sighs> and that's partially because in a weird way, we have all, well, maybe we didn't all know this, but now we do. A lot of people do know. It's just been kind of one of those things. Well, dry cleaning has always been a really risky and dangerous business, right? We were washing with gasoline, yeah. you know? <laughs> Buildings yeah. were exploding and we were like, oh, well, keep going, you know, um, and, and, you know, it's like most of us don't know how bad this is, but now we do know. And it's kind of like, wow, why, why is this still happening? Like, yeah. why is that okay? I assume we could ask, like, if you go to your dry cleaner, we know that 70% of dry cleaning uses it. But like, if you're, if you're not down with perk, right, you could ask them, right? Is this something that you use and make a decision based on that? Absolutely. And I have some other options that I'm going to share with you that you could ask them about. What I was reading is that more and more dry cleaners are realizing they have to move away from this. Like, it's only a matter of time. Well, they're killing themselves. Exactly. Exactly. So I think we're <laughs> going to see more and more of that shift over time. But definitely ask. So here's something I learned for that. Like, you learn something new every day file. Um, you know how dry cleaning always comes in a plastic bag? It always does. And mm -hmm. per garment, right? And it's tied up. That's possibly one of the most necessary pieces of plastic in use right now because wool cotton and polyester tend to hold on to that perk even in a week a wool garment only loses about half of the perk on it and we know that those fumes are dangerous if you keep it in the bag for a few weeks until you're ready to wear it more of the perk will evaporate into the bag rather than into the air and that's a really good thing like you don't want to Put it in the car as you're driving home and open up the bag. Don't do that. Um, and you kind of want to keep that bag on as long as possible because otherwise it is. It's evaporating into your home, your lungs, your cat's lungs, everyone in your household's lungs. Um, silk is the only fabric that does not seem to hold on to perk, but just about every other fabric does. So there are... I have seen these. There are dry cleaners that offer green or eco-friendly dry cleaning options. And I'm using those terms, even though they're very greenwashy, because that's what I've seen on signs. Um, there are a few different things they might be using here. And once again, I would advise that you ask. Um, the most common version of so-called eco-friendly dry cleaning uses a solvent called Siloxane D5, which hasn't been researched to the extent of PERC because it's newer, but it is most likely carcinogenic based on preliminary research. And it accumulates in the bodies of both humans and animals. It also hangs out in the environment. So you probably want to skip that one. Uh, some places are using a silicone-based solvent, which is a little bit better, but this process can also involve chlorine, which can be a little iffy as well. Um, liquid carbon dioxide is actually the safest because it uses a naturally occurring gas and recyclable cleaning agents. So that's, that's what you really want to ask for okay. when you ask a dry cleaner. Now, some dry cleaners are shifting to using wet washing for almost everything, obviously not things like leather. Um, and they're using like really special detergents and washers that are formulated to be the least damaging. But I have a caveat with that as well. The rental company that I mentioned that I worked for before the pandemic, uh, we, were s we were wet washing like 99% of the things that people rented. We had these crazy expensive washers that came over from Italy on a boat. They were huge and they were specially designed to 
wash anything. They have like 20 different cycles programmed into them. I mean, we use very special detergent that we could only buy from the people who designed those. I'm sure it was crazy expensive. Um, You couldn't use it for leather or suede or anything embellished like that. But for the most part, you could put anything in there. The thing is, we did see a lot of damages that were coming out of those washing machines because no matter what, you're still putting a bunch of clothes in there and they're getting mixed and tossed all around, which is just enough to stretch out or damage really delicate fabrics. We also, I remember we had a bunch of down coats that we brought in and the guy who ran the warehouse, he's not with that company anymore. He was part of my French. He was a fucking idiot. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) He was just like one of those people who is like, not a cool dude and does a lot of really messed up stuff, but is always right. And he was like, yeah, we can put down coats in there. And I was like, I don't, I remember when we met with the laundry guys and they said, no down. And he was like, no, you're wrong. It's cycle nine. And I was like, okay. So we were renting out these down coats that cost like $500. They do a load of them and they don't even inspect them. They just send them back out to customers and customers are sending us these like (sighs) nightmare emails where they get the coat and all of the filling for the entire coat is in one corner of it. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. So or like not only is all the filling in one corner, but then there was so much pressure in that corner that it burst open and when they <gasps> opened the boxes, feathers flew everywhere. Oh. You like that kind of thing. Oh. Um so I would also just be like for this kind of thing, I like once again, you need to ask these questions of your dry cleaner like what are they doing because you know, you want to do the thing that is the best for extending the life of your garment, but also like, you know, yes. for the planet. Mm-hmm. And so it's just really important to ask these questions. And it's not, I think it probably feels awkward at first, but like, this is just how, how it is. Right. So yes. now that we've heard all this devastating stuff about dry cleaning, we go back to my odyssey that began many years ago to figure out just what do you have to dry clean, even if it says dry clean only. There are <laughs> many things that you can hand wash at home rather than sending to the dry cleaner. In fact, a lot that you do not need to dry clean, even if the label says it. Clothing made with wool, silk, or cotton can be generally washed by hand, very gently, of course. You cannot wash suede, leather, fur, feathers, that includes down filling, or any other fragile fabrics. Still, this should check a lot of things off of your list. You're also, if something is lined, you just want to be aware that you have to be so careful. Like if it's a wool blazer with a, like a satiny kind of lining, you're going to be, want to be really careful when you dry this, like when you lay it to dry, because two different fibers means things can get kind of weird, right? Yep. So first things first. Before you start doing your hand washing, you want to take off any rings so you don't snag your clothes with your jewelry. If you're a bracelet person, I would suggest that as well. You want to use a clean sink or basin filled with cold water and a gentle detergent. And here's the thing. You want to fill the sink or the basin before you add the clothing because even the force of the water running out of the faucet can stretch out some fibers. This is all about like being as just gentle as possible you only want to use about one teaspoon of very gentle detergent wool lead is a great example laundress to be honest i think if you're you know as long as you're not using something with like optical whiteners or built-in bleach you're probably fine as long as you're using it in very moderate doses Mm -hmm. um you don't want the water to be sudsy in fact if the water is sudsy You need to immediately remove that garment, dump out all that water, and start over because suds means there's too much soap in there. And what that means is you're going to have to rinse it and rinse it and rinse it. And the more you rinse it, the more damage you're going to do to the item and stretch out the fibers and all of those bad things. So you want to be very minimal. A little bit goes a long way. You want to soak everything for about five minutes. You only want to do a few garments in the sink at a time um, because you don't want things to be rubbing up against each other. Um, you want to make this as just like non-frictiony as possible. Um, <laughs> after five minutes, just get in there and do a very delicate swish. You are not a washing machine. Gentle swishing only here. 
Then lift the garments out of the water, put them aside, dump out the water, let the sink to drain, fill it back up with clean, cool water. No water should be involved in this any at all. You're going to re-add the clothing. You do some more really gentle swishing until no suds appear. Um, you might get this rinsed in one pass. You might need to multiple times dr- take out the laundry, drain the water, refill it, put it back in, and gently swish. And you want to just do that until you get no suds at all. Remove the clothing every time you're doing it. Now, you've successfully washed the clothing. Now you want to dry it. You wanna, you're you not going to completely dry it, but you're going to mop up the excess water by placing the garment between two towels and then rolling it up gently. This is not a contest. It's not like a strong man contest. You're going to roll it up gently like a little Debbie Swiss roll until the excess water is removed. Then you're going to lay it flat to finish drying on a third towel or maybe, depending on what you want to do here, you could maybe hang it. I also learned, and this is way too bougie for me, but if it's a super delicate item, which I don't own anything like that, but like if it was like lingerie or something like that, and it's like super prone to snagging, don't do the towel rolling and instead use a satin padded hanger to absorb the excess water, just like rolling it over it very gently. That is extremely bougie. Fancy. That is extremely bougie. I don't even own one of those. <laughs> I've seen them on TV. (laughs) I saw one in a free pile once and I thought about it. And then I was like, Amanda, what are you going to hang on that thing? (laughs) Yeah. Um, You're going to want to be sure to put your clothes in a well-ventilated room to dry. You're going to avoid hanging things that can stretch or lose their shape. And you're also going to want to sort of like reshape any sweaters that are drying. Now. Yes. Sometimes you can also use the gentle cycle on your washing machine, very obviously with cold water. This is only an option for sturdier fabrics like cottons, linens, and stiffer polyesters. I guarantee you can gauge the ability to throw this in the washer just by feeling the the fabric, right? Mm -hmm. Do not do this. If there's beading or embellishment, you will regret this. Do it by hand. Um, I also don't recommend... Basically, nothing that is prone to snagging, whether it's a natural fiber or synthetic, we're talking chiffon, satin, that should never go in your washing machine because it is going to be Snag City USA. Um, If you're a little bougier, I also recommend that you put each garment in its own delicates bag in the washing machine. It's pretty fancy, but you can get those bags at like the Dollar Tree. So that's another option. You should not be using the dryer at all. It's not even an option in this situation. Do not. You want to lay items flat to dry. Um, If they're they're lighter weight and they're not going to probably get stretched out by hanging, you could also hang them to dry on a hanger. Perhaps your padded satin hangers that you're going to be hoarding now. I don't know. Um, No matter how you wash all this stuff, you can use a steamer to remove the wrinkles. And that also kills germs if you're worried about this not feeling like it's clean enough or getting rid of odors, that can help a lot too. This is a lot of work, right? Yeah. (laughs) But you also, I'm going to say this again, you should not need to wash your clothes every time you wear them. I spot clean mine. If I have smelly armpits when I'm traveling, like I said, I have this little tiny bottle of Dr. Bronner's that I carry in my travel kit. I put a a drop on a washcloth, a little bit of water. I scrub the armpits. They're minty fresh. Hang them to dry. It's fine. I love Dr. Bronner's. Love it. Yes. And the mint, this is purely, I'm not an expert here, except that I've done it. I swear the mint will get rid of BO immediately. Mm. That's awesome. (laughs) It might be psychological. I don't know. (laughs) But I swear it cancels it out. So there are those weird home dry cleaning kits. Have either of you ever used those? Way back. Yeah, like the dr- way way back. Back. dry yeah. yeah. bags or whatever they were called. <laughs> dry L. Yeah, I was trying dry to remember L, the names. Yes. So I used one once. It was a really long time ago. And all I felt like it did was make my clothes smell weird. Um, yeah. Not dissimilar to Febreze, to be honest. The Spruce, which is a great resource for laundry. They have laundry tips for everything. Says that they do work as long as you're not looking to get a lot of cleaning done. To me, it just seems like pretty wasteful. <laughs> So, yeah. and it's also weird to me that you would be putting your clothes in the dryer, right? Your delicate clothes that need to be dry cleaned and you're putting them in the dryer. Yeah. It's just, and they're rubbing all over each other. Yeah. It yeah, seems really weird. 
Um, if you are listening to this and you've had a better experience with it, let me know. But I just, I don't, I, I, I'm weird about it. And they smell weird. And they're kind of expensive. Um, leather was something I got a lot of questions about. And it can be spot cleaned with a damp paper towel or a spray leather cleaner. Some people swear that you can soak just sections, not the whole garment, in a mixture and dish soap and water and then hang it to dry. I'm pretty wary of this. Proceed at your own risk. Um, I would just recommend to stay on top of spot cleaning. Something gets on your jacket or pants or whatever this leather garment is of yours and maybe take it to the dry cleaner every few years if necessary, if necessary at all. Um, once again, if if it's like Oh, it's really just like the armpits that smell. I would just clean the lining inside because that's really the source of the stink. Yeah, yeah, spot cleaning here. Yep. Um, But there are things that like no matter what, you are going to have to dry clean and that is just the way it goes. Fur, yep. suede, taffeta, fine velvets, not like the velvets clothes that you can go get at like Zara or H&M or whatever. Those are actually like a poly base and you could probably hand wash those pretty easily but like fine velvets. Um, if it has intricate or delicate beadwork or embroidery, I think you can hand wash with caution very carefully. Um, and I would just say, if you have to dry clean, look for someone else, someone who uses the carbon dioxide method. And if you can't find that, which could happen, we know that 70% of dry cleaners are still using it. Lay your clothes air out in the yard or on the porch for a day or two. Do not store them in your car. I have one friend who I felt like was for a while always drying, driving around with just dry cleaning hanging in the back. I was like, when are you going to take this in the house? Um, don't do that. Put them in a place with some ventilation. <laughs> um, so that's that's my story about dry cleaning. Do either of you dry clean stuff? Are you risky like me and just wash it? It depends. If it's something like you talked about, if it's stuff that says dry clean only, but it's a sturdier, I will do mm -hmm. a hand washing or a gentle cycle and then hang to dry. Um, mm -hmm. But I've sewn in, I've, you know, being someone who sews a lot, I've, I've had enough experience with fabrics that I'm pretty clear on what I can and cannot do myself. Yeah, yeah. It's usually outerwear for me, like coats and things like that. Um, yeah. That's got me thinking about a a horror story. I had a really great like wool um, trench pea coat and it had this like faux fur trim around this giant hood. And I decided to wash it instead of taking it to the dry cleaner and the, the faux fur got really matted and weird. Um, Ooh, yeah. uh, but I ended up using just like a, a brush, like a hairbrush to break it up and it, it looked a little bit better. Uh, but in retrospect, I kind of wish that I had gone the dry cleaning direction for that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the thing about a coat is, even if you get it dry cleaned once a year, that's reasonable. Um, I definitely have friends who are, like, way more life organized than me, who, like, every year when spring rolls around, they take the coat in for the dry cleaner, bring it home, and put it in the closet until next fall i of course i'm like not like that and then like fall no. comes in i'm like oh my god this coat is covered with spaghetti or whatever but uh <laughs> to get your coat dry cleaned once a year that seems very reasonable to me um especially if you can find a dry cleaner who's using non-toxic methods like it's yeah. great i do not think you should wash a coat i do think if you like through the season you're like it's getting a little ripe inside once again spot cleaning is your friend get the vodka out spray the armpits whatever um, I think that that can be fine. And like, it, it just comes back to like, I think that especially Americans, we wash our clothes way too much, way too much. And that's how it's sold to us that like, if you're a good mom, if you're a good adult, you are absolutely just laundering up a storm. Right. And it's just like, you, you don't really have to, um, which is a great transition into jeans denim which is the mm -hmm. ultimate like you don't need to be washing it all the time right um someone right. asked how can you make your jeans last longer what kind of washing um and these are some of this is going to feel a little rep repetitive after everything we've been talking about but i'm just going to lay it out first off you want to skip detergents that claim to brighten or whiten which is definitely something you will see on the packaging because they contain optical whiteners 
that are going to fade the dye on denim and really all dark colors faster. So skip them. Um, turn jeans inside out before washing. And that really goes for anything dark. It can prevent the dye from bleeding or rubbing onto other things. If you hang them outside to dry, which I would recommend, or just hanging them up in general, but if they're outside, turn them inside out to prevent fading. These like little tiny things that take 15 seconds can really extend the life of your jeans. Um, this was a really great idea, which I have heard from other friends who are like major denim aficionados. If it's a brand new pair of jeans that you just bought, brand spanking new, or you got them on Poshmark, new with tags or new without tags, bring them home and soak them in lukewarm water, which lukewarm water is not very warm. That is why it is lukewarm. It's just not completely cold with salt added to it. And that will help the dye set and should help prevent a lot of fading down the road. So that means you're going to have to put off wearing those brand new jeans for a day or two maybe, but it will extend the life of them quite a bit. Number one thing with jeans to make them last, especially if your jeans have any stretch in them at all, which in 2023, you have to go on an odyssey to find jeans without stretch in them, even just a tiny oh, bit. Oh, yes. Right? Yep. The dry, very little rigid denim. Very little. The dryer is the worst enemy of your jeans, even though with the really stretchy ones, it often feels as if you have to dry them every time to get them to go back into shape. The reality is that tumbling around, flopping around, flipping around in a hot dryer actually breaks down the elastane fibers, which are what give it the stretch. And that shortens the life of the jeans pretty significantly. and. It gets you into this cycle of like each time the jeans lose their shape faster um, and don't return fully. And then like 20 wash and dries in, like they're just, you're going to have those baggy knees oh, all the time. so familiar. Right. Oh. I know. Right. I've been in this cycle too. Um, Nightmare. I just like don't wash them that often. I and mean, how often you need to wash them is really up to you. But like I have definitely worn the same pair of jeans for a month without washing absolutely if you're like these feel yeah. dirty or oily or they have food on them obviously you can also do some spot cleaning here i would just say if you buy a pair of jeans and you find that the only way to get them to fit you consistently is to wash and dry them every time you wear them which we've all been in that trap do mm -hmm. not buy another pair of those jeans yeah yeah it's like a vicious cycle i when, back when I was really into wearing black skinny jeans pretty regularly, it's like that was the cycle I was in, you know? And then there would just come a day where they never bounced back. Like they were just yeah. these husks of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and it would come pretty that, fast, you know? Yes. Yeah. That, is, that is a serious, serious thing with the heat for the elastane. Because yeah. you're not going to find jeans that are 100% cotton very often anymore. And if you do, they're probably workwear. So keep them out of the dryer for sure. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, what about like mending denim? Because I feel like that's kind of like the ultimate pro mending challenge. I have a lot to say about that. Okay, tell us. I have so many things to say about that. Okay. Um, mending, mending denim. It is possible to make denim near immortal. Um, <clears throat> you can even do it on a domestic sewing machine if you have a domestic sewing machine. But... There are so many methods for mending. There is visible mending where you can literally create new art out of, you know, jeans that may have been a little bit thrashed or had a hole in them. Um, there's straight up, you know, invisible repair, which is jean darning. Um, mm -hmm. Darning rebuilds the fabric in place of where it was no longer there. That works best on, on little to no stretch. Um, but there are I, myself as someone who is a mending artist, I have found workarounds to do some, uh, what I call light darning on stretch jeans that keeps them going a little longer. Um, but there are so many ways to mend it. Find yourself a professional who does mending and repairs and who has a darner because they can be made to be like new again. It's pretty rad. Absolutely. And when you find the pair of jeans that you love, like this is the goal to have them for as long as mm -hmm. possible. So here's my question. I suspect I already know the answer, but I'm just going to ask you, um, what about those <laughs> iron on denim patches that you can get at like Joanne? Thoughts? Please don't. Just please don't do it. <laughs> They're the worst. Just, just, 
<laughs> all the no, all the no's. Just don't do it. Don't do it. I don't know anyone who has ever successfully mended with those yet. They're still out there for sale. Right. I know, and it blows my mind because you can iron them on over and over and over. They're going to pop every single time. Take it to a professional if you are not a sewist yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what about you, Maggie? Have you ever had success with those patches? I've never tried them. Um, all I can offer, I think, to this segment really is like empathy for like the the fellow people out there who have the familiar like thigh um wear and tear where they like bust yes. open mm-hmm. at the inner thigh area i think we've all been there at one point um and just to reinforce what tracy said about darning like you would be surprised stunned even to see what is possible oh, yeah with that method it's i mean i i say it's like magic i've used that word a few times but like Tracy is literally a magician with this shit. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> I do love, I love, do love to darn me some jeans. I, I, I love to impress people with jeans they can keep wearing forever. Just like, don't wait until it's like so far gone that your entire butt is hanging out. I was going to say that the <laughs> best time to, it, if we want to talk about avoiding having these big, huge rips and trashing our jeans in the first place, the best time to seek someone professional to help you with that is the minute it starts to go or if it is getting so worn that you know it's going to go anytime because that is when we can do the best and most invisible repairs um if if they're blown out we can also do we can do some rough rough, i call it a rugged repair you know if something is really 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 destroyed i can still put it back together it's just going to look rugged instead of brand new so as soon as you can get your stuff to to a mending artist the better off you are yeah, totally. Don't put it off. I know it's hard, uh, especially if you maybe only have one pair of jeans, which is a feeling I know right. very well. But don't <laughs> don't just keep just keep putting it off. Yeah, um, don't keep putting it off. Don't try those patches. They're they're, they're so stupid. Why do they still make them? It like infuriates me. <laughs> right. Take them off the market, please. Okay. So next, someone asked, "How do I wash items that are dyed with plant or natural dyes?" And I actually looked into this because I was like, "Oh, that's pretty interesting," and it's pretty basic. Like as we have said approximately one hundred times so far, wash them in cold water and wash like colors together. You know, your darks, your lights, your reds, all that kind of stuff. If you have two different colored items and both are naturally dyed, they're different colors. Wash them separately because their dyes may interact with one another and change the color of both of them to neither of the colors that they are currently. <laughs> like weird chemical stuff can happen. It's a great so way just, to describe that situation. <laughs> <laughs> they'll just become a new yeah. color uh-huh. that'll probably be like a weird orangey brown in my experience. So uh, unless you love that, I would say just be really careful. Once again, it's about slowing it down, being more careful. And if you're not washing all the clothes five minutes after you wear them constantly, you're probably going to have less laundry to do and have a little bit more time. Yep. Um, yep. Okay. So another topic, which I'm going to just tell you, I am the last person to give you advice in this area. And that is ironing. I am the <laughs> world's worst ironer. I only, I have an iron. It's only for craft projects. I'm really pro steamer. <laughs> uh, Cause you can, it's, it's a lot harder to fuck something up with a steamer you know but with an iron it can go awry really fast um and i have ruined things not for a very long time because i realized i don't deserve to use an iron on clothing but i would ruin things by (laughs) going too hot and too fast right it's a classic so yep give us some advice here on ironing um personally don't iron unless you really have to um because you know we all have those stubborn wrinkly woven fabrics that like crinkle up like tissue paper that you have no choice but to iron um use a pressing cloth especially if you are ironing on synthetics because you will get that sheen if you know Mm -hmm. what i'm saying um anything that is synthetic you got to set it is so imperative that you set your iron on the proper heat setting please do not try to iron synthetics with a hotter setting like you know the cottons and whatnot you will absolutely melt the fabric and that's again another reason to use a pressing cloth just like a cotton cloth in between the iron and the fabric um particularly like i said if it is synthetic um and 
um, already said, you know, really watch the temperature of your iron. Please don't go using the cotton <laughs> setting on anything but Seriously? cotton. But just don't, don't do it. You might, you might, you could melt your clothes to your iron, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah. Um, Been there. and I often <laughs> will just toss. Yeah. I, I, I try to avoid ironing at all costs, but you know, some things do need to be ironed. I use it on the lowest setting that I can. Um, and yeah. And then I just hang everything up and let the, 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 a lot of times just hanging things will, the wrinkles will occasionally, you know, fall out of it. Not always, but <laughs> yeah, I avoid the iron as much as possible. And for God's sake, use the pressing cloth so you don't melt your clothing. Seriously, yeah. especially right now with most clothing, I want to say 70% of clothing that has been made in the past couple of years is synthetic or synthetic blend. Like don't fuck around and find out. Just get a pressing clock. <laughs> right. You will be so depressed. Yeah. You will be. Yeah. 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 While we're talking about ironing and thinking about de-wrinkling, I just have a couple of quick tips and it kind of brings us full circle to our conversation about products and household items. Um, some people, you may be this person, I don't know. Some people like a stiff collar, like a starch collar. They want mm. starch creases in their pants or whatever. Um, of course, they make commercial starches and sprays and all that stuff. But one thing that will work in a pinch for that purpose is an alcohol-free hairspray. I actually just did an experiment on this, I think, last year. Um, so alcohol-free hairspray will work as a starch. But you can also make your own starch with literal starch, like cornstarch, dilute it in lukewarm water. Just, you know, shake that up in a reusable spray bottle and it works great the cool thing about corn starches nice. too is that like it breaks down you know there's not any like weird funky chemicals you know uh, or any discoloration that happens uh, when you put it in the wash afterwards it's really lightweight it's not like some of those commercial starches are like literal glue almost it's yes. like freaking concrete yes um so these are soft flexible but will give you that nice like I'm thinking of collars in particular, if the point, you know, mm -hmm, in the front mm -hmm. folds up or whatever, this is a really nice method to get that where, you know, to lay nicely and, and flat. So that's a great one. Also, if you're like the kind of person who uses cloth napkins and wants them to be perfectly unwrinkly, I also recommend using <laughs> cornstarch. <laughs> yeah. Like if you're really, really detail oriented and not just like moving around like a human tornado, like me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> same with like I'm not that fancy. I'm not that fancy either. Don't worry. <laughs> same with like table runners or tablecloths. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. it's a great natural solution for sure. Totally, totally. Well, I feel like we have we have really hit all of the laundry questions. All the laundry so questions. A lot of ground covered. Yeah. Yes. Um I would say to anyone who's listening, if you still haven't found the answer to your question, send it my way. And we'll see what we can do. But I feel like this is pretty comprehensive. Like, we basically just wrote a book about laundry. Right. Um, okay. So I want to thank you so much, both of you, for all of your expertise and patience as we went through this and all your extra research and just everything else. Um, I wanted to end by asking the two of you about the project the two of you have been, have been working on together. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to share. Um, so we're, we're calling this a creative collaboration. Some might call it a joint venture or a partnership with a lowercase or an uppercase P. Either way, what we are doing um, is a collaboration that brings together my skills in personal styling, personal style support, and professional thrifting with Tracy's skills in garment mending, repair, alterations, and embellishment. So it's kind of a, a one-stop shop. Um, but we're focusing exclusively on secondhand items. So the collaboration is called Thrift Fit Fix, very aptly named to articulate exactly what we're doing for folks. And yeah, it's a really cool opportunity to kind of bring our complementary skills together and like double down on the value that we're able to deliver to clients. So it's a really exciting collaboration and we're having a blast that you, you literally have you know, the dynamic duo with the two of us because Maggie is the pro stylist and Tracy is the pro make that clothing fit you. So it's an awesome, awesome opportunity. Yeah, like I we're, love this. 
we're able to go thrifting physically with clients and kind of provide on this on the spot con consulting for like helping them see possibilities with a garment, personalizing those those pieces so that they're going to fit well, but you know physically, but also fit their personality. Um, yeah, it's you know Tracy's used the word immortal in our conversation our mission is kind of to immortalize your style like help your garments last but also help you feel really confident and empowered in what you wear that it's like yours and uniquely your own um so yeah it, it's pretty damn awesome and i'm excited to be able to talk about it uh, we're going to be going live every other friday in 2023 so the next one It'll be before this episode goes out, um, but just just keep an eye on us both on Instagram. Um, we'll have a lot more to share. You can also sign up for updates so you can get a peek behind the scenes of like what this looks like as it unfolds. And yeah, we're stoked. I mean, I'm so glad that the two of you are doing this. I think, you know, this year, one of Clothes Horse's big, big focuses is Earth Logic which is really about minimizing our consumption of new items and getting maximum use out of everything in our lives, which has always been the ongoing theme of Close Horse, but really like to give it a name feels, feels to me, it helps me stay focused, right? And so yeah. a lot of my content this year is gonna be really about how we can reduce our consumption of new clothing by 75%. Obviously, it's just January now when we're recording this, but the the thing I keep seeing over and over again showing up in the comments section, showing up in DMs is like, I can't find secondhand clothing that I like or that fits me. I guess I can't participate in this. And so I'm really just beyond thrilled that the two of you are helping people solve that quandary because it is out there. It's just not as easy as going onto Amazon right now, ordering something, and it's showing up at your house tomorrow. It's going to be about, it's a slower, more complicated process, but I would say that anything that is worth doing, that you really truly are passionate about and care about, is worth putting in that extra effort and that time. So I just can't wait to see how this goes for you this year. We're very excited. Very excited. Um, well, thank you both so much for sharing all of your expertise tonight. And of course, I'm going to share all of your information in the show notes so everybody can go follow what you're working on this year. Um, and of course, if lots of new laundry questions show up, we'll figure out how to get back together to talk about them. Love it. Thank you so much, Amanda. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you again to Maggie and Tracy for spending three, yes, that's one, two, three full hours talking about laundry with me. To be honest, I think we probably could have talked for three more hours. So maybe we'll have to do a sequel. I'll be sharing all of their contact info in the show notes. So please give them a follow. In the intro to this episode, I promised you some more laundry info at the end. And of course, I'm here to deliver it. We're going to get started with Febreze. I have always wondered if it really worked and what quote really worked would mean in this situation because it's just so mysterious to me ostensibly something is smelly you spray it with febreze you allow it to dry and miraculously it doesn't smell anymore except for now it smells like febreze which is its own very distinctive smell right no matter what other fragrance is added into that bottle you know febreze when you sniff it. <laughs> okay, so Febreze was first introduced in the United States in 1998. And since then, it, I mean, it's been successful. It's expanded into room sprays, candles, plug-in oil infusers, and car air fresheners. Basically, like, if something smells bad, anywhere you might encounter it, Febreze is here to help you. What's interesting is that when Febreze was initially introduced, it kind of flopped. Why? Well, in the beginning, it was marketed as a way to get rid of unpleasant smells in your home, from cooking, pets, smoking, or just, you know, general mustiness. The thing is, most people, myself included, are kind of immune to the smell of their own home, no matter how strong it is. So if you aren't aware of the smell being an issue, and I say issue in quotes, 
then why would you buy a product to, quote, fix it, right? And so that approach just did not work for Febreze. A lot of people are like, what? My house is fine. So Febreze's manufacturer, Procter & Gamble, a company that I loathe, that's a whole episode right there. So I'm not going to go into it now. But Procter & Gamble took a different approach. Instead, they focused on the implied cleanliness of a nice smelling home. So basically, if you want people to think your house is clean, make it smell nice with Febreze. The further implication was that Febreze was somehow making a space cleaner via its magic. To get to the bottom of whether or not Febreze does clean anything, your home, smelly laundry, a cat box, whatever, you have to understand how it works. So the whole phenomenon of smell begins with odor molecules. When odor molecules are released into the air, whether that's from a pizza baking in the oven, a flower in bloom, a litter box that could use some scooping, those odor molecules travel into our nose where they're detected by olfactory receptors in the back of our nose. This information travels to our brain. It's way more complicated than that, but let's be real. This is not a neurology podcast. It's not about anatomy and physiology, anything like that, although I'd be willing to try it. So I'm giving you the very simplified version, but all that information travels to your brain and voila, we smell something. Some odor molecules can originate in, you know, unclean things like the dirty litter box, the mildewing laundry, the smelly armpits, and our favorite dress. The best way to rectify that bad smell is to clean up the source of the smell. Other things like cooking food or cigarette smoke, they're more about providing more ventilation to clear the odor molecules. Febreze, despite its implication that it is cleaning the air or a space, is not actually cleaning anything. And this is what I'd wondered about because I just couldn't figure out how it worked. Does Febreze work in terms of removing smell from things? Totally. Like I said earlier in the episode, there was a jacket that I Febrezed every weekend for probably two years because I would wear it out to the bar and then it would smell like an ashtray the next day. I would spray it with Febreze, let it hang in the shower, and yeah, the next day it didn't smell anymore. So I knew it was doing something, but what was it doing? So like I said, it wasn't actually cleaning anything. Febreze just lends the air of cleanliness, which is, is that a pun? Is lending the air of cleanliness a pun? I have no idea. Anyway, in addition to not cleaning anything, Febreze also does not remove the odor molecules from the air. What it does do is trap the molecules and prevent them from being picked up by your nose, but they're still there. The key ingredient in Febreze is, I'm going to try my best to pronounce this properly, beta cyclodrextrin. Let's never say that again. (laughs) It It was like all tensed up just trying to pronounce that. Anyway, that ingredient is a ring shaped sugar molecule that is derived from the starches found in corn or sweet potatoes. For some reason, reading that, I was like, yeah, I can smell that in there, right? Because the smell of Febreze, like I said, is very specific. And no matter what other fragrance is added to the particular formulation of Febreze you just bought, there is this note underneath. And I really think. It is those starches that we're smelling. So this ring, it traps the odor molecule where it will remain suspended forever, I guess. Maybe not forever. I don't know. Ignore me on that one. It will remain there until you actually clean away the source of the smell. In the case of food or smoke, you probably just need to open the window or door and let those odor molecules move outside, right? If it's an article of clothing that reeks of smoke, it's probably better to just skip the middleman of Febreze and just hang it outside or in the window for an airing out. You could even probably just put it in the shower for a day or two. Febreze isn't really doing you much of a favor in these situations, right? It's kind of just slowing down the process when you could just add some air, you know? In the case of mildewing laundry or a dirty litter box, 
Febreze is offering a temporary solution. But you really just need to scoop the box or wash that laundry. It doesn't change that fact. For example, if a pair of well-worn shoes is stinking up your closet, I have been guilty of this. Is guilty the right word? I don't know. But let's just say I have some shoes I've had for a long time that I don't wear with socks often enough, and they smell bad, right? I can smell them in my closet if I don't take care of them. Rather than spraying them with Febreze, which is just a temporary solution to a bigger issue, it's best to spray smelly shoes with a mixture of one part vinegar, one part water, and just let them dry. You're spraying either way, whether it's Febreze or vinegar, but here's the deal. The bacteria in the shoes are the source of the odor molecules, and the vinegar will eliminate the bacteria, and then there will be no more odor molecules coming from it. Febreze is just trapping the odor temporarily, kind of masking the true source of the issue, creating an illusion of cleanliness. And ultimately, if you haven't cleaned the bacteria out of those shoes, they're just going to smell again. And then you're going to have to hit them with the Febreze again and again. So do I use Febreze? No, not anymore. For one, I am extremely sensitive to the smell of it which leads to headache and nausea for me. Even in that era of spraying that coat constantly, I felt like for the first hour of every day when I was wearing that coat to ride my bike to work, I I had a terrible headache. I felt sick. I just thought that's what life was, right? (laughs) I guess you just feel sick because you smell like chemicals. So I skip it. Furthermore, while Febreze is non-toxic to animals, unless you apply it directly to them, do not Febreze your pet, please. It sounds ridiculous, but when Febreze was first introduced in the United States back in the late 90s, I was volunteering in an animal shelter, and we had a lot of issues with people Febrezing their pets and their pets being very ill or dying. So do not Febreze your pets. Even though it's non-toxic to use around the house where pets live, it should never be used around birds. I don't have any birds in my house, but something about that just feels concerning to me. There's been a lot of mixed data on the health impacts of Febreze over the years, and I don't feel like anyone knows enough to make a verdict. More importantly, I I just don't need Febreze. After all, It isn't really fixing anything. It's not cleaning up the source of a smell. It's just a bunch of chemicals and a plastic bottle that I really don't need to waste that are just a temporary quasi fix for a bigger issue that could just use a little bit of cleaning. So that's the breeze. I wanted to end the episode by sharing some of my biggest laundry lessons. Most of them have been learned the really hard way. Maybe you've learned them the same way. (laughs) Maybe you have some other lessons you would like to share. Number one is take your time. Just slow it down. Listen, I know the chaos of taking a toddler to the laundromat, of trying to get it all done before nap time just feeling as if you're racing the clock. And even if you don't have kids or you have the ability to do laundry in your home at your leisure, you're probably busy with 10,000 other things every day. Laundry has often been an afterthought for me, a necessary and time-consuming task on a long list of necessary and time-consuming tasks. And it is that mad rush to just get it done that has led to a lot of ruined garments or at least a lot of additional time and stress spent trying to fix something that went awry in the washing machine that could have been prevented with just like 30 extra seconds of care. Seriously, take the extra minute to check all the pockets for one. That's that's a lesson right there for me. I have melted so many lip balms, ibuprofen, gum, candy, you name it, over the years. I have washed a lot of pens and magic markers. I one time washed an actual paper check that I needed very badly to pay my rent. And well, anyway, it was a whole odyssey to fix that situation. In the best case scenario of any of these missed pockets, these laundry misses meant I had to buy another lip balm. In the worst outcomes, I spent hours trying to remove stains or almost destroyed beloved garments and linens or 
couldn't pay my rent for another week. Another way in which it's important to slow it down and take your time is when it comes to removing stains. You want to take the time to do a spot check of any new treatment option before you go all in. You don't want to lose color or destroy fabric. A few extra minutes there can mean the difference between actually finding a solution and removing a stain and destroying something you love by accident. Number two on my list of laundry lessons I have learned the hard way, time spent on stain removal is money saved. I expend so much emotional energy and brain space worrying about money. And thanks to my need to survive in late stage capitalism, so maybe I can worry about money just a little bit less, I don't have a lot of free time. Basically, time and money are two luxuries that I just don't have. And stain removal takes some time. Sometimes it takes a few Google searches or a few nights of soaking or trying new things to finally get it right. But ultimately, doing the work to resolve a stain is going to save me the money of buying something new, and the time of trying to track down a replacement. Taking the extra time to work out a stain, even though it might take several tries, is time well spent. Furthermore, the way I look at it is this helps extend the life of the clothing I already own, which is a key element of the slow fashion way of life. You know, many conversations about slow fashion, sustainable fashion, what have you, online, on social media, really focus on what to buy and where to buy it. It's all still so shopping focused, but doing your laundry, giving your clothing the care it needs to extend its life is one way in which you can be the ultimate slow fashion warrior without buying any new clothes. Okay, number three. Read the care and content labels inside your clothing. Seriously, this is so important. You need to know what's in your clothing so you know how to wash it. It will extend the life of your clothing to know this and be able to treat it properly, and it will save you a lot of money and frustration and probably a lot of time. One symptom of the fast fashion era, which we talk about quite a bit here on Close Horse, is that retailers and brands have shifted into fabrics that are complex blends of fibers. Why? Well, this isn't going to surprise you to hear because it's a very easy way to lower the cost of a garment while still maintaining certain qualities, certain sensory characteristics about it. Things like softness, hand feel, even the way it drapes or reflects light or holds color, it can even give a garment a higher perceived value, meaning you're going to pay more for it, even though the fabric is super cheap. Like, trust me, there are some really complex blends out there, and they all start as a way of cutting costs and increasing profitability in the fast fashion arena. So. You might think something, just by feeling it, is fully cotton or polyester or made of angel hair for all I know, because sometimes these garments feel that way. They evoke an emotional response in us where we're like, oh, this is light and delicate, or this is sexy and free, or this is cozy, or this seems breathable. But it's probably a mix. Probably that fabric is a mix. There might be some viscose, some elastane thrown in there. It's a little bit of cotton. It's a little bit of acrylic. It's a little bit of poly. All kinds of stuff thrown into that fabric. So check those labels because all of those fibers have different care attached to them. Here in the U.S., all mass-produced clothing is required to have these labels. You will find them either at the neckline or on a side seam by the waist. If you're shopping online, any decent retailer is going to share fabric contents on the product page. If they aren't, this is my experience, something I've learned the hard way, you should assume it's a synthetic blend. It is so important to me to know what the fabric is before I make the purchase. And there are several reasons there. For one, it's hot and humid in Texas, and I don't wanna wear polyester. I wear natural deodorant, and I don't want to feel smelly all day. Secondly, 
I want to know if I have the bandwidth or even interest in giving this garment the care that it needs. And if it's something that snags easily or is prone to permanent staining, I just don't want it in my life because it's going to give me way too much anxiety. I have a cat that likes to sit on my lap while I'm working. I can't wear something snaggy, right? I work in the yard a lot. I don't want to get caught on trees and like totally just lose something. I don't want to spill a little bit of coffee on something and it's the end of the the story for that garment. So I like to know what I'm dealing with before I even buy it. Here's another lesson I have learned the hard way. It's number four. It is skip the dryer until you know a stain is fully removed. I know we talked about this a lot in the last two episodes. I just wanted to say it again. The heat of the dryer will set a stain. So skip drying until you think it is as good as it's going to get. If you need to see the item fully dried in order to know if the stain is gone, let it air dry. Yes, this can add a little bit of time to the process, but it is worth it. And remember, rule number one, lesson number one, take the little bit of extra time. It's worth it. Okay, number five is a lesson that I have learned by being just supremely thrifty and emotionally attached to my clothes. An unremovable stain doesn't have to be the end of a garment's usefulness. For example, I was wearing a favorite vintage dress. It had yellow and orange and brown flowers all over it. It was probably from the late 60s, early 70s. And I was in a bike accident. I had bloody hands, bloody legs, bloody face. Everything, there was just blood everywhere. I cried a lot. It was very painful. I was picking gravel out of all my skin, it felt like. And when I was done cleaning my wounds and assessing the damage, I realized there was a lot of blood on my dress. I did all the things I already knew. I washed it in cold water, you know, all all the stain removal stuff I knew at that point. But there was just one spot there that would not come out no matter what I did. I didn't want to give that dress up. So you know what I did? I always wore a pin on that spot. Uh, Usually, at least at that time, a yellow daisy brooch. No one would have ever known otherwise. It was a great fashion accessory and it extended that life of the garment pretty much infinitely. There are many other options for working around a stain rather than letting it be the end of of a garment. You could embroider over it. You could add a patch. You could dye the garment. You could even just say, I always layer this with a scarf, cardigan, vest, what have you, to cover that spot up. I have used belts to cover ketchup stains. I mean, there's always a way to keep it going. You could also just say, hey, guess what, world? I love spaghetti. So what? That's a spaghetti stain. It's fine. Okay, number six There's nothing wrong with saying, I know I'm about to do something risky from a stain perspective, like bike maintenance, working in the garden, or eating buffalo wings, and then changing into something sort of unstainable. Just just do it. Know yourself. Wear a bib if you need to. It's fine. Number seven is a big one that will save you a lot of money, and it will save a lot of water. You don't need to use as much detergent as you probably think you do. No matter what the bottle may say, one tablespoon of laundry detergent is enough to clean an average size load of eight pounds. Yes, the detergent bottle might say more. It probably says more. The handy dandy measuring cap that came with that bottle might indicate more. But you have to remember, detergent brands want to sell you as much as possible. So it's in their best interest to tell you to use more. It's like the Lather, rinse, repeat instructions on shampoo bottles. You don't need to do it. To be honest, I have thought about that direction on shampoo bottles and gone down an Amanda conspiracy theory hole of like, oh, this is all part of the hair product industry trying to sell us more hair products when our hair gets super dried out from overwashing it. Then we need special conditioning masks and styling treatments and on and on and on. As I'm saying this out loud, I think this is a real conspiracy, actually, and I hope you agree. Anyway, back to detergent. Using too much detergent adds up financially, but it also affects your clothing. Too much detergent can create too many suds, which makes it difficult for your clothes to rub up against one another in the wash cycle. That friction loosens trap dirt. And furthermore, the excess detergent builds up on your clothing over time, 
changing the texture and making fabrics less soft and drapey. If you suspect that your wardrobe has detergent buildup, you can soak it for one hour in a mixture of one cup of white vinegar and one quart of water. Although you're gonna wanna test a little bit of that vinegar on a garment to make sure it's gonna be okay, right? We always wanna take that moment to do a spot check. I recommend getting yourself a tablespoon, an actual measuring spoon, and putting it by your washing machine or putting it in the bag of stuff you take to the laundromat. You're gonna be surprised by how much less one tablespoon of detergent is in comparison to what you've been using. Okay, number eight, this is another big one. You probably don't need to wash all of your clothing every time you wear it. Real talk, laundry wears out your clothes over time, period. It also consumes a lot of water and energy. Some stuff you wear will need to be washed every time you wear it, and it's all up to what's comfortable for you, right? But I would say underwear, workout clothes, anything where you're sweating a lot while you're wearing it, right? I definitely do a lot more laundry in the summertime when I'm sweating a lot more, working in the garden, mowing the lawn, just getting dirty. But in the winter, I tend to wash my base layers regularly. And the rest of my clothes, I kind of spot clean. I highly recommend if you're traveling on vacation or for work, bring along a little bottle of Dr. Bronner's for dealing with stinky armpits on the go without having to bring extra clothes. One drop goes a very long way. I've never done the vodka spray treatment for removing underarm odor because the smell of vodka is another one that triggers headache and nausea for me. But many of my friends swear by it for de-stinking your armpits, not your physical armpits, but the armpits of your clothing. This makes sense to me because it kills the bacteria causing the smell in the first place. So keep a spray bottle of vodka and water under your bathroom sink and spray stuff when you take it off so it's ready to wear the next time. Once again, do a little spot check before committing to doing this regularly. Number nine, this is something we talked about quite a few times in the last two episodes. Time is of the essence when dealing with stains. As I mentioned in the last episode, I keep a bottle of stain treatment spray in my bathroom under the sink because that's where I undress. It's very convenient for me and it prevents me from forgetting. If I've spilled something like coffee or other food on my clothes, I spray it before adding to the hamper because it buys me time to deal with that stain. If it's a bigger issue, like I have spilled red wine all over myself, which doesn't happen because I don't really drink red wine, but it has definitely happened in the past, I don't put it off, right? I deal with it right away. It's like a big deal like that, fine. Anything else, spray it, throw it, it's good to go. Speaking of stain treatment spray, most of these work using enzymes that break down the proteins within a stain, and they are great and effective. However, you should not use them regularly on protein-based fabrics like silk, wool, or cashmere. You can use them occasionally, but regular use will damage the fabric. In fact, for cleaning those items regularly, you're probably gonna be hand washing them in the first place. So you want to ensure that the detergent you're using to do that hand washing is enzyme-free. Read the bottle to know for certain. And number 10, my last lesson I've learned the hard way that I'm sharing with you is that the internet is a great resource for getting answers on laundry. The reality is that no podcast episode, even of Clothes Horse, No Instagram post, even if it's a great one by Clothes Horse, is going to solve all of your laundry quandaries. We did our best to help as much as possible in our three-hour conversation. So much work and research went into this, but there are still many questions that we never received. There are probably a few bullet points we didn't hit on. Fortunately, Lots and lots of people are sharing their own information and expertise about stains and smells and all the laundry disasters all over the internet. Whether it's, do I really have to dry clean this? Or how do I get candle wax off of bedding? The internet has answers for you. You don't have to guess or give up. I would say try Googling 
removing blank stain from blank or how to launder blank. Read a few different articles and figure out what you want to try first. Learning is one of life's greatest pleasures and learning about laundry is pretty easy in the internet age. I also find if you're looking for one stop to learn as much as you can about all of your laundry quandaries, go to the Spruce. That's the spruce.com. This is not sponsored by them. I have just found them to be a great recurring resource for me over the years when it comes to laundry. They have really great detailed info on all things laundry related. They really, they just break it down into easy to understand guides, even if laundry is something you're just starting to learn about. Okay, well, that's all I have for you. I just want to remind you all that laundry is important and it is highly skilled work. It is a key element of our impact on the world around us. The time, energy, and care you invest in making your clothing last longer is time, energy, and care well spent. Laundry matters. Thanks for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse. Written, researched, edited, hosted, all the things by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, you could leave a rating, maybe even a review if you're feeling spicy on Apple Podcasts. But most importantly, tell a friend, get them in here, teach them all the laundry tricks. That's how we spread this information and that's how we grow this community. If you'd like to support my work financially, you can learn more at patreon.com slash clothes podcast. There's one last thing I wanted to share for all of you who actually listened this far into the episode. <laughs> And that's the thing, a new round of Small Biz Big Pick is starting in just a few weeks. You know, I receive a lot of messages practically on a daily basis asking me for free business advice or mentoring. And others have requested episodes of Close Horse that are solely about how to run a business. Well, I'm not going to make an episode about how to run a business because that's not going to be compelling content for everyone. And I don't offer free business advice and guidance. Well, for two reasons. One, I just don't have the time. But also, I know it is one way in which I can be compensated for my labor. I'm giving out plenty of free information on a daily basis about so many other things. I know that my expertise in the area of business is actually something that people can pay for. So Small Biz Big Pick is a series of 10 classes for the current or aspiring small business owner, regardless of the age of their business. All classes are taught by me and my friend Courtney of Sonic Wave Vintage, and we share best practices around pricing, day-to-day operations, marketing, assortment planning, customer service policies, branding, partnerships, so much more. Courtney gives two classes that really just focus on making the most of Instagram and making reels and using it as a free marketing tool. The goal of Small Biz Big Pick is fostering small businesses in hopes of redistributing wealth from a small number of huge corporations to a thriving network of hundreds of thousands of small businesses. I mean, that is close horse right there, right? Each session is about two hours long, including questions and answers. All the classes are conducted via Zoom. If you miss a class or just want to revisit it, you get unlimited access to all of the recorded sessions for your review as often as you want. All sessions also come with a follow along workbook and some reusable tools. And yes, there is homework for every single class. You can sign up for the whole 10 class package or just take individual classes. You can choose to participate in the live classes where you'll meet a lot of other small business owners in our community. You know, in the last two rounds of Small Biz Big Pick, we've seen so many friendships develop in the midst of class, which makes me so happy. And I see all the graduates supporting one another online. It warms my heart so much. If that doesn't work with your life and all the other stuff you have to do, you can also take the recorded classes on your own time. You can learn more about Small Biz Big Pick by going to smallbizbigpick.com. I bet that website name really shocked you. Dustin built us an amazing new website a few weeks ago. It looks so good and I feel so lucky to live with someone so talented and generous. So even if you're not interested in the class, just go give it a look so you can see what a great job Dustin did. (laughs) 
You should also give us a follow on Instagram at smallbizbigpick, where you'll learn all kinds of other tips and tricks. And I'd like to thank, as always, my other half, Dustin Travis White, for our music and audio support. Bye. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.